thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and and for and Greg for moderating. Uh, and like I uh, like I said earlier to Greg, uh, the strict restriction should apply not only to uh, you know, the questions asked because there's wide range of possible questions that we can uh, entertain, but also uh, to stop me from giving too long answers uh, if it occurs. Um, so, uh, so, so I also want to kind of start with a background about how this talk came about, uh, because this is not a usual, uh, um, this is not my usual work. This is not a model that I, uh, you know, that I saw for equilibrium. Um, uh, Andre and uh, Julian asked me at some point, would uh, blockchains, uh, blockchain businesses replace or disrupt, uh, uh, disrupt um, uh, platform businesses, platform merchants. And I said, that's an interesting question. I actually was thinking a lot about the relations between blockchains and platforms and, and how they could compete and how, how blockchains could affect competition in block in, in platforms market. So let me um, say, you know, say, this, this talk is more about setting up a question and hypothesis and, and frameworks or how to think about those technologies. Because blockchains and blockchains are, you know, this new technology that, that, uh, that promises decentralization, disintermediation and democratization. And we already had a technology like this, this was internet, and that led to biggest intermediaries that we have ever seen. So will uh, blockchain really deliver on the promise uh, that, uh, that the internet only partially delivered on? Um, so this is how uh, I, I kind of set it up as blockchains versus platforms. And uh, uh, this goes back to the question that, uh, that Andre and Julian asked, uh, will blockchains disintermediate platforms? I'm, I'm actually you know, flattening the question here. Um, but uh, the, the, the background, I'm not going to spend more than half a slide about what the platforms are in general for this crowd, uh, but just to kind of pin the, um, the attention is our platforms, the, the defining feature almost of the platforms is that they attract independent uh, users, independent parties, and they connect the, partic the participants. Online platforms very often connect them algorithmically. Uh, and uh, there are strong network effects. Network effects create barriers to entry, but if the platform can uh, get their network effects on their side and overcome uh, the network effects problem, coordination problem, then uh, a successful platform uh, can actually enjoy network effects and harness, um, uh, harness the benefits of it, either through higher prices or through other ways of extracting value. And this uh, ability to extract value attracted uh, attention of proponents of blockchains who say, oh, we have this decentralized structure. Uh, would it be possible, or maybe proponents of blockchains assert that it would be possible uh, to provide similar services as platforms do, but on blockchain, there will be no entity that would uh, capture this additional, uh, this additional um, value. And therefore the value would be distrib fully distributed to all the users. And this will uh, be a better deal for the, uh, for the users, for the economy. So uh, I'm, I'm exploring here the question of whether it would really be the case and maybe what dimensions we need to look at. And of course, you know, to start with, I'm I'm assuming that I'm not going to, I will not need to explain a lot about uh, about platforms, but we should uh, be a little bit clear about what plex, what blockchains are and what blockchains do. Um, I, I say blockchains in in plural because there are many different designs of blockchains. The blockchains, different blockchains may have different color characteristics. Um, uh, but uh, uh, and and I am going to get into uh, what, the, what what is the common characteristics of many many blockchains. Um, but typically, when we start when we talk about blockchains, we start with Bitcoin. And something to be said is, Bitcoin was created as this decentralized way um, of managing uh, digital uh, digital currencies. So this is a very specific problem and Bitcoin is a solution to a very specific problem. 
So whenever we have digital goods, digital goods are digital files are really easy to copy perfectly. Uh, and uh, as much as it's great when we want to copy files and send it among the cultures and uh, between our devices, when we are seamlessly copying and costlessly copying uh, music and movies and uh, and digital goods that are uh, that that have been created by somebody else. It's called piracy. It's a you know it's a it's a problem. But if we would be able to seamlessly copy money, uh, then it would be a disaster for this money system. So this is called a double spending problem because you can spend the same uh, digital dollar over and over again because it's just a digital file. Um, this double spending problem typically for digital currencies uh, is solved by having a centralized party that keeps the ledger and basically keeps track of whether somebody already spent this $1 or not. And this is what we have with credit cards, with banks. So digital money has been around for a long time. The, what, what Bitcoin brings is the distributed or decentralized digital money where we get away um, we can create a system without any uh, any central uh, trusted third party to manage the ledger. Right? So by design, by the virtue of being a solution to this particular problem, it is distributed. It means that it's composed of only peer-to-peer -peer nodes. None of those nodes is more important than others. But it's even more than this. Uh, th to this extent, there is no nobody is more important than anybody else, that there is no, not only no trusted third party, but there's also no party that is that would tell who can belong to the system and who cannot. And this is what makes it a permissionless. So this is like the the ideal democratic uh, democratic situation. Um, the way that this uh, uh, this this problem was solved in Bitcoin is that all the transactions in the uh, in Bitcoin currency are collected in blocks and they are linked by uh, by hash pointers and this is what gives it a name a blockchain because the blocks are are linked in a chain. Um, and uh, the validators, anyone can become a validator. Validators compete uh, to to be able to add this block of transactions to the. Uh, uh, to the blockchain and uh, whatever is in the blockchain is kind of commonly agreed on. I'm going to comment on that. Um, but what is even more important in particular setup of Bitcoin, all the transactions are public. Uh, so anyone can, um, can, uh, can verify validity of the transaction and can anyone can make sure that there is no double spending that the same Bitcoin has not been spent twice. Uh, and while they are public, they're also pseudonymous. We don't really see the identities. We just see the, uh, the wallet identifiers uh, and anyone can have as many wallets as they want. Um, and maintaining integrity of the ledger relies on costly mining. So the, the way that uh, misbehavior is kept at bay, that validators, even though nobody is policing them, um, they need to uh, they need to really do a lot of costly work they are rewarded by new bitcoins and uh, and this makes it worthwhile but this costly uh, uh, costly mining is what uh, is one of the main features that uh, that assures credibility of the ledger now i'm not going to get into the the main details of how it works uh, for that there is there are a lot of works and i can i'm happy to recommend but um, something that is related to that there are a lot of economic forces and a lot of game theory involved in the in Bitcoin system. Um, but very often Bitcoin uh, is, is, um, is said to be immutable. And this is not the case. So um, you can rewrite the ledger. It is possible. It's just rewriting this ledger on purpose in case of Bitcoin is very costly. And it is costly exactly because mining is costly. Mining is costly exactly because or mining is costly in Bitcoin because Bitcoin price is high and miners are willing to bear this cost in order to get those Bitcoins. And this is why if we have currencies with exactly the same design, but with, uh, uh, but, but with lower value of currency, they actually have experienced this uh, rewriting or double spending or, or changes in the, in the blockchain. So here I am going in this talk, I'm going to assume that we have a well-functioning uh, blockchain. Uh, and there's a lot of work about what makes a blockchain well-functioning or not under different conditions. I'm not going to focus on that. 
Um, what I do want to kind of mention is what do we mean by the ledger? So we have a well-functioning blockchain. It's for all practical purposes, immutable. And we keep talking about the ledger. And if you read anything about blockchain is the ledger. The ledger indicates like there would be just one ledger and there would be some reference point that anyone can refer to. But in reality, uh, there really isn't one ledger. There are those independent peer-to-peer -peer nodes. Uh, nobody is more important than others. And each of them keeps, a, keeps their own ledger. And they update this ledger based on uh, the information, the messages that they are getting locally from the nodes that they are connected to. There isn't like all um, public, uh, public broadcasting. I'm not sure whether I got the same message that anybody else. And the ingenuity of the consensus system is such that we are going in a well-working consensus system, we are all going to end up with the same copy of the ledger. And, uh, and this, is, this is important, I think, for what the blockchains are offering uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of interactions and opportunities and uh, as platforms. So the ledger is really a shorthand for consensus. It is many, many ledgers, but if everything works well, we have many, many copies of the same ledger. So um, Bitcoin's blockchain is just one possible design of blockchain. When um, Bitcoin uh, got, to the, got to the media and um, there was a lot of excitement and it seemed to have worked. And uh, even though the, despite initial skepticism, there was no double spending, even though anyone can become a miner and anyone can participate in the system. There were uh, a lot of voices about how about using the the uh, Bitcoin system uh, for moving any other value or for creating other systems that are coordinating and creating consensus in a similar way between independent parties without any trusted third party. Uh, now, quickly, it became clear that the Bitcoin, the particular Bitcoin uh, uh, blockchain is not a good, uh, good solution for the industry uh, and enterprise solutions uh, for enterprise use. So first of all, public transactions would not be really good for competitive behavior because you would need to reveal all your transactions to your competitors if we would put everything on the same shared uh, ledger. Uh, pseudonymity does, does not really work for a small number of players because you can easily identify them by transactions. There's high cost of mining, which is crucial for Bitcoin to be reliable. And uh, nobody really wants to bear this high cost of mining and uh, has environmental impact as, as well. And what is important is that uh, Bitcoin's particular blockchain offers only probabilistic settlement. So uh, at any point, you may learn that you actually don't own the Bitcoins that you thought you have. They just disappear from your wallet uh, because there may also be accidental. Uh, so even though it's protected against more or less malicious, but there may be accidental reorderings of the blockchain. Uh, and it comes from the peer to peer nature. So instead, enterprise uh, blockchains are mostly permissioned, and there is a number of well-working uh, well well um, uh, initiatives there. Uh, they are designed based on uh, per distributed systems that have been around uh, for a very, very long time. Any uh, internet company is relying on distributed databases. Um, but the new thing, uh, and very important thing, uh, is that the uh, old fashioned distributed databases were only within a company. There would be many, many nodes that would need to coordinate and reach consensus within one company. What blockchain consensus mechanisms that were developed since, what they allow us to do is to have this uh, cooperation and bringing together independent companies. So we see the enterprise, uh, enterprise blockchain um, where uh, we have a shipping industry like Tradelands, uh, that is cooperation between Maersk, Maersk and IBM, where a lot of independent shipping companies are getting on the same distributed uh, system, which is which is blockchain system. Um, and it also is possible to have a system where we share this information, but we don't necessarily see the information. So what we have is uh, I can see a footprint of, footprint, footprint of the information. I don't see the actual data, 
But if you later tell me that this data was something else, I'm going to be able to verify. So you can have a verifiable or ex post verifiable information uh, even without seeing the information. So it solves the problem of the transparency, which was the problem for the uh, for using Bitcoin's blockchain on uh, for enterprise. Um, but uh, for permission blockchains, you need to have some uh, trusted third party, at least to give permissions. But it is possible that this trusted third party actually has no power over uh, any changes in the transaction. So uh, whether permission or permissionless and many, many different designs of blockchain, what I'm going to say that the defining feature of blockchain is, and I'm saying that because we don't really have a well agreed upon definition of blockchain. So what I'm going to say a defining feature of the of blockchain is that we have a ledger of uh, uh, information that is reliably shared between independent self-interested parties. And reliably shared meaning that it's verifiable. This information is verifiable, even if it's sometimes exposed. And that means that um, parties that participate in the ledger, they have a symmetric information about what the state of the world. Um, and uh, can be verifiable by cryptographic proofs. Whether it's immutable or not, I'm not going to get into it, but even when something changes, we all see this change happening at the same time. Um, and another thing that is important is that the consensus mechanism itself is uh, actually a way of algorithm uh, algorithmifying uh, governance. So the government's decision about which of the transactions is valid in their conflicting transactions is decided algorithmically. And therefore it can be much quicker and without this, uh, without involving any management because there is no management in this environment. Okay. So what is important is that once we have this shared ledger and we are sharing data, this data may be a code or a program that is running with the data. So we can have processes that are shared between different parties. And I don't see your data, but we can have the same program running on your data and my data. And even though we do not see each other's data, the program is going to give us the same outcome automatically. Uh, so that would allow us to algorithm, uh, also algorithm, algorithm five processes and use of data between independent entities uh, with or without sharing it, but without anyone having a master copy necessarily or, or having a, a, a power to give us or not give us access to this data. Okay. So it's used for many, many, uh, many um, applications. It could be in the shipping industry, the replay, automatic replacements, replacement of shipment if the conditions of the shipping were not according to the contract, or tokens are example of the smart contracts. So this is the this executable code that is shared between the ledgers, or is on the ledger, and therefore it's the same for everyone. Okay. So on top of the smart contracts, we can actually build uh, applications, the dApps. And dApps are going to be uh, uh, to to uh, to consist of smart, sometimes very often several smart contracts that are linked together. Uh, some other soft software on top of that. So if we have a game, then there is some other uh, software on top of smart contracts, and then there's a user interface. The very first dApp was a game on Ethereum called CryptoKitties. Uh, CryptoKitties were fetching hundreds of thousands of dollars, so it was a uh, a, a kind of a, 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 a nice example of how to start <laughs> this um, uh, this uh, this phenomenon. So DApps stands for decentralized applications. But something to be noted here is that those applications, even though they are running on blockchains, and even if they would be running on permissionless blockchains, they do not need to be decentralized themselves. So smart contracts, even running on, the, on permissionless blockchain, may restrict who can use a smart contract. And then if you add to that, that creator of the smart contract, creator of the app, there's, there's another software layer, then there's even more uh, decision to be made and uh, a managerial decision, so to say. So the, so the apps may be very much centralized 
uh, in the sense that somebody is making managerial decisions about pricing, about access, about uh, about any other strategic decision as, uh, as in regular businesses. Okay, so with that, um, let me spend the second half of the uh, of the talk on a uh, relation between blockchains and platforms in the in the sense so um greg are there any clarifying questions at this point uh, no questions so far and you're pretty much right on halfway through the time yeah okay thank you uh so um so the the relation is multi uh, multi dimensional. So first of all, most blockchains are really platforms, and I'm going to elaborate on the, on that. On the top of that, blockchains can host platforms. So those D apps are maybe platforms themselves. Okay? And the third way in which blockchains and platforms relate is that the traditional already existing platforms can use some blockchain tools like smart contracts and tokens, and there are many examples of this. Here, I'm going to focus on the first two uh, bullet points, and I'm not going to, to discuss how traditional platforms are using uh, the, uh, the tokens or smart contracts already existing platforms. So most blockchains are platforms uh, because just like platforms, they bring together multiple individually optimizing participants. Um, uh, the participants join voluntarily. So this is the difference between blockchain and just uh, any distributed uh, database uh, that we had within companies. And typically, the more participants uh, you have, the higher value is to, of joining the blockchain. So if you think about Bitcoin, the more miners there are, the safer is the uh, the safer is the uh, Bitcoin's blockchain, and the miners are attracted by the price of Bitcoin. But really, the and the price of Bitcoin is uh, is is coming from uh, from having higher security and more trades. So we have this this network effects, the two-sided network effects feedback loop, um, running in a very straightforward way. Uh, but even in other examples of of, uh, of blockchains, if we, for example, take a consortium of banks or uh, or supply chain uh, tracking uh, system that is like uh, our shipping a uh, uh, shipping blockchain, then the more of your counterparties are already on the blockchain, the higher is the benefit because this, the smoother is 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 tracking and there are no holes in the information. Uh, so you want to join. The same, uh, the same blockchain that your other suppliers, that your suppliers have joined so that you can have this information moving seamlessly. And just like in the regular platforms, in blockchain platforms, we see a variety of platform types. Uh, so we can have blockchain platforms that are, that are different in governance, control, and the, the role of the platform provider. So uh, here are brought, um, uh, kind of, of, of uh, 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 a categorization and topology of platforms that are as well traditional as blockchain. So uh, in the traditional platforms, we mostly focus in our analysis and in uh, economic endeavors on the centrally managed platforms that have a variety of strategic, strategic choices on price, access, of uh, advertising and uh, you know the number of uh, uh, number of items that you see when you when you are making your choice and so on. Um, and the, uh, there is some uh, some discussion about open platforms uh, when we talk about Wikipedia and uh, Linux, for example. Uh, those uh, discussions about open platforms are often. Uh, focusing on uh, comparing the open platforms and the centrally uh, managed platforms. There do exist also uh, co-op and consortium platforms, but we typically don't really explore them much more in much, much in our research. So uh, MasterCard and, uh, and Visa before really going public, they were a consortium platform owned by the banks. Uh, Swift is a consortium platform, but there are many others. There, there are competitors to, uh, to Uber, there are competitors to uh, Airbnb that are consortium platforms that are owned by the participants and they are jointly managed. 
We see the same kind of structure of different platforms in blockchain platforms. So in blockchain platforms, the focus is actually on different, uh, uh, it goes in different direction. So we mostly, uh, you know, what, what, what is mostly discussed in the public sphere is Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are completely open platforms. Uh, there is nobody, they are even more open than Wikipedia and Linux because there isn't uh, really, especially for Bitcoin, there isn't anyone making final decisions or vetting or, or being able to shut down the website, uh, like in the case of Wikipedia. Uh, and similarly in Ethereum, despite Vitalik Buterin's uh, of, uh, uh, engagement, uh, he could no, he would not be able to shut down the, um, the network. And they do operate very effectively. Um, but we also see uh, a co-op or consortia platforms uh, running on blockchain. So a, a kind of well-known example where this discuss example would be what was called Libra and now it's called DM, the effort of Facebook to gather other, uh, other companies and together create this consortium, uh, uh, consortium uh, blockchain uh, for managing of stablecoin. Uh, there, there are, so Spunta, uh, Spunta Banca is a consortium blockchain for banks in Spain uh, that is already operational. Uh, and there are also centrally managed platforms that are based on blockchain and they were created uh, solely because the blockchain technology was available. Uh, so this would be Ripple that is connecting uh, banks for inter, uh, for, in, uh, for um, inter, uh, uh, international payments. Uh, Lucidity that I'm going to mention a little bit at uh, a little bit more is uh, is a platform for advertisement for mobile uh, for mobile advertising. Connecting Food is uh, uh, or kind of IBM Food Trust as well. Those are um, a blockchain uh, blockchain platforms uh, that are tracking uh, or providing tracking and supply chain management for food services. Um, now, the Spunta Banca is an example of this co-op uh, blockchain platform. Uh, it has, um, it is owned or it, uh, it brings together 98 Italian banks. It was promoted and it is promoted by, by Italian Banking Association and it's coordinated. So the key here is it's coordinated by the ABI lab, but it's owned and controlled by the banks. And so it is operational uh, for, for a while now, and uh, now it's used only for reconciliation processes. This shared, uh, shared ledger is very useful here uh, to make sure that the, um, that the banks do not need to go through the multi-steps reconciliation of their own individual ledgers. And there are more D apps planned on top of this blockchain uh, for the future. Now, what is important because of the structure, the co-op structure, is that nobody can unilaterally decide to increase price for participation in this uh, in this blockchain in this platform. It needs to be made jointly by some share of the uh, of the of the users. So this is in contrast with Lucidity, which is, like I said, a, a blockchain platform for mobile ads. So the issue, the problem uh, in, with mobile advertising is that the, advertiser, the ads are going through multiple uh, ad exchanges between the advertiser and reaching the final customer. Those ad exchanges have their own metrics. Uh, they, uh, they, they report in a way that is not necessarily consistent one with, one with another. And advertisers complain that they don't really know whether the ad is displayed to the, uh, to the population that they paid for. Um, so what, uh, what Lucidity does is uh, it tracks the advertising uh, through participating exchanges. So exchanges that participate in the blockchain um, can, uh, can, can get the, the ads that Lucidity is contracted to display. And uh, smart, the metrics are governed by smart contracts, which is reconciled, uh, which makes sure that all the metrics are reconciled throughout the supply chain. So, and there is a tr the transparency provided by the blockchain and the tracking. So we can really track the, all the ads from the, from the advertiser all the way to whom it was displayed. 
And uh, this transparency yields higher willingness to pay by the advertisers. So uh, companies like Toyota, for example, said that they're not going to advertise on mobile through any other uh, channels, but Lucidity, because otherwise they don't know where the money is going. Uh, so right now, Lucidity is paying the uh, ad exchanges for participating in the blockchain. But you can also imagine that when they become more uh, demanded and they uh, they get more the higher share of demand in the whole market because they are so attractive to advertisers, they may ask uh, the uh, and ad exchanges to pay for participating in their blockchain because the ad exchanges are going to have very few ads outside of the blockchain. And they are making unilateral decisions on the on the prices. Okay. So uh, uh, with, with that, uh, with those examples, I actually want to uh, go back to uh, to emphasizing what uh, blockchain technology is bringing to platforms and how does it uh, differ from internet. So internet already was providing us with more content because it was easier to transfer information between individuals, but the content is subjective. On, the, on blockchain, you are getting a, with shared ledger, verifiable and symmetric information. Uh, and this allows, to, uh, this allows us to alg algorithmi algorithmify uh, processes and use of data between independent uh, entities uh, so like unifying the uh, unifying the, the metrics. Uh, and uh, just as internet was allowing us for algorithmification uh, within a company. So now we can do it between the companies. And this may allow us to also algorithmify governance, like in the case of Ethereum or Bitcoin. And uh, permissionless access may, uh, may also uh, open access to services that before were restricted, like for example, financial services. So we see it in the explosion of DeFi uh, applications. So this uh, this algorithmification of uh, of in the of processes and of governance may be especially beneficial for uh, open and co-op platforms in order to improve uh, governance and monetization because now we can have channels to move money around in a completely open system and before if you wanted to move money around you needed to set up some kind of monetary like either connection to a, a credit card or to uh, or maybe your own bank but somebody would need to keep track of money now we don't need to do that, okay? So going back to the uh, uh, to those different types of blo of platforms, uh, pre blockchain and blockchain, we can actually see uh, different, or I like to uh, divide them into different categories. So I would say that centrally managed platforms, whether they are blockchain or not blockchain, they have very common feature. They make a lot of those strategic decisions unilaterally, and uh, the uh, centrally managed blockchain platforms, they're using blockchain as technology, but the fundamental economic forces are very similar. And this is why I call them, well, initially wanted to call them Tirol, Rochette, Coyote, Julian platforms, but it's quite a mouthful. So I uh, went for Toulouse platforms. Uh, so Toulouse platforms are centrally managed and they do have a wide, uh, wide variety of strategic decisions that they make unilaterally. Uh, and I contrast them with Nakamoto platforms, uh, which use blockchain and attributes of blockchain to improve the centralization of decision making. Uh, and this may allow for those uh, consortia and open platforms to operate much more efficiently and allows for also monetization. Okay, on top of uh, the platforms uh, that the, the, the blockchains being platforms, like I said, the blockchains can host other platforms like the apps. And what is, what is important is that blockchain can give rise, for example, blockchain that is completely decentralized like Ethereum or, uh, or Bitcoin can, rise, can give rise to new platforms and intermediaries that are centralized. So it doesn't, um, so we can have examples of Nakamoto platforms and Toulouse platforms that are coming from Ethereum, for example, or they can, that can be built on, uh, on even with Bitcoin. So Uniswap is an example of this open and decentralized trading app 
many of many millions of dollars are are going are being traded uh, through this uh, through this exchange but it is operating without any trusted party uh, that would be setting prices and collecting uh, uh, collecting the surplus and extracting value uh, on the other hand, the crypto kitties that I already already mentioned, the game, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the people who set up the game, the company that set up the game uh, has full power and they make a lot of decisions, including uh, pricing and how large a cut of the trading they are taking and they can, they can change the decision. So this is an example of a, of a typical Toulouse platform. Uh, and they even made decision to move the, uh, the D app from one blockchain to another blockchain. So strategic decisions are even more than just pricing and access. And OpenSea is, uh, is an uh, intermediary facilitating creation of NFTs. I didn't talk about NFTs, but it's basically a trading platform. So it helps you set up your NFT and it is also an auction platform. And it is much more similar to very traditional platforms and intermediaries and any other auction platform like, uh, like, uh, like eBay. Uh, rather than uh, similar to Ethereum being decentralized. So it is again a Toulouse platform. Okay. So I think that instead of asking whether platforms will replace, uh, whether blockchains will replace platforms, we should be asking whether Nakamoto platforms would replace Toulouse platforms. Uh, so uh, let's suppose that uh, you know, we have a completely open and decentralized ride sharing app like, like uh, uh, similar to Uber, but it would be a Nakamoto platform. So Uber is not taking the fees, it's not taking the cut, it's distributing all the value to the, to the users. So would it replace Uber? Would it be more attractive than Uber? Would it be cheaper and better? So in fact, we can uh, inform our thinking from already existing studies about uh, competition between open and proprietary platforms. So what, what we're learning from those studies is that while open platforms often offer lower price for a given size of the network, they face challenge in actually coordinating and growing the network. And this is because the proprietary platforms can offer subsidies, can actually go and, and advertise much more uh, and, uh, and they can quicker improve, uh, improve quality. There's also an important element that uh, I don't think has been explored very much in the literature is if you have, for example, consortium platform or open platform, the, there is a big difference in incentives, in objective function. So uh, a centrally managed platform is going to have objective to increase uh, profit of the platform. Whereas if you have an open platform or a co-op platform, it's going to have the individual members have different objective than maximizing the total uh, value of the, uh, the total profit of the platform. And this fundamental economic, these fundamental economic forces are not changing if we have a technology like blockchain that is, even if it's allowing for open and co-op platforms to operate more efficiently. Uh, so uh, Nakamoto platforms, you know, may or may not drive to lose platforms out. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm just making hypothesis here and it is actually a subject that could be a good subject for future research. And I think that in this crowd, I want to convince, convince you that it's a good topic to take on and explore. Um, I suspect that Nakamoto platforms can increase competitive pressure but mostly for open and co-op platforms. And, for, and as co-op platforms are more efficient, maybe it will increase pressure on the Toulouse platforms. Uh, they may decrease barriers, uh, barriers to entry uh, by removing these participation restrictions, but this probably applies to small set of industries where those restrictions are already existing. Okay, so, in conclusion, uh, what I uh, what I am arguing here is that blockchains and when working property again, I'm not I did not get into this those conditions. They offer a shared ledger of information, and this facilitates linking processes and automation between independent entities. And this is a new um, new aspect, and uh, it may facilitate this centralized governance, which we make our open platforms and cooperation co uh, co-op platforms more efficient. But blockchain platforms can be both centralized or not. So they could be Toulouse platforms, what I call Toulouse platforms and Nakamoto platforms. Uh, for uh, 
uh, co-op and consortium, uh, a co-op consortium and open uh, blockchain platforms, uh, they may be more efficient than non-blockchain open platforms. And uh, that, may, uh, that may provide this competitive pressure on the centralized platforms. Uh, the open blockchain platforms may provide access to services not available to individuals otherwise for at least some set of services. And, uh, and the, like I said, Nakamoto platforms may increase competitive pressure on Toulouse platforms as well. But in the end, I would say that all types of platforms may benefit from blockchain. And what is still you know, an open research question is which of those, uh, which type of the platforms is going to benefit most? And uh, just to kind of uh, finish, if you are interested, if this talk succeeded in interesting you in, in, in blockchains and you want to explore blockchains in relation to platforms, you may also like the so uh, together with co-authors, I wrote a, uh, a, a summary of um, or overview of literature on economic forces uh, that are playing out in, uh, in the cryptocurrencies, which is, uh, you know, one of the open platforms. Uh, so this may, this is a clear link between economics and 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 blockchains, and also the uh, the book that I have with uh, Mikkel Sarver and Guillaume Herringer now uh, is going into the second edition, and both those papers, so both the book, the chapters of the book, and the uh, the gel paper are available on SSRN. Uh, so for the book, those are preliminary chapters, and in fact, any feedback would be uh, would be very useful at this point if you have. Okay, so uh, let me finish here, and thank you very much. I hope it was. Uh, uh, I hope I'm going to get uh, more co-authors working on uh, and all, and competitors working on blockchain and uh, platforms. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hannah, for the expert timekeeping. Um, now we go to Andre for a five-minute discussion. Sure. So again, this is a pretty different talk from what we normally do in keeping with that. So this, I'm not going to discuss as we normally discuss a paper, but it's more like I want to sort of drill a bit deeper into the, um, some of the points that Hannah made. By the way, Hannah, this was, this was great. I think it was, a, it was a great setup for the, uh, and I guess rephrasing of the, of the question that we initially had in mind when we, uh, when we talked about, uh, about you presenting this. So just to sort of push the discussion for, uh, forward based on what you, what, you, what you talked about, I think what would be really interesting is, is to see if we can nail down a little bit more clearly what the, tr what the main trade-offs are between the Toulouse platforms and the Nakamoto platforms. So maybe say, um, let's say I'm thinking of basing a platform on blockchain. So right, I can be somewhere in between a pure Nakamoto platform and a pure Toulouse platform, but I'm, I'm considering using the blockchain. So what will be the main trade-offs? Like what are the main benefits and the main issues? So like, there, I think there's some interesting economic issues here, right? I think you hinted at some. So, I mean, I'll just say a couple that I think are pretty obvious. So one of the great things about basing, so if you're basing uh, your platform, like we're using some elements of the blockchain, I think a key thing, which you hinted at, but I think we can discuss in more detail, is there's some aspects of governance that instead of being unilaterally decided by the platform sponsor, I mean, I think of this being like a dictator, right? I mean, I can choose to do whatever I want in terms of governance. There, sometimes there might be some benefits in having those algorithmically done. It's almost like a credible commitment to have a democracy in some sense. So that could be one benefit. On the cost side, I think you mentioned some, right? I mean, there's slower decision making. It's a little bit harder to solve the chicken and egg problem. I can also think about issues around with the switching. If, if we're basing the platform on the blockchain, presumably this, I mean, I think my intuition is the switching cost would be lower. So it's maybe a little bit harder to have winner take all than with like with traditional platforms. So, I mean, I'm just curious what your, what your thoughts are. So can you can you elaborate why you think that the switching costs would be lower if we base our platform on? So that's a good one. So actually, I think maybe that's one of the, the key ones because we, that's one of the key questions, right? That we always do with network effects. Do you, do we think it's going to lead to tipping or not? So I haven't thought this entirely through, but my and, and uh, my idea was something like, if I'm basing my platforms on a blockchain, I mean, there's it's a bit like open source, right? I mean, I'm I, there's a mechanism in there 
that is outside my control. And I'm thinking others can basically build very similar platforms on the same, on the same base, right? So like for instance, um, so will be a good example. Let's say the ride sharing part, because you like, there's a bunch of articles online saying, you know, Uber is a, Uber is a blood sucking intermediary and therefore we're going to create, a, uh, you know, there's going to be um, is it like some blockchain initiatives that say we're going to create like a million competing Ubers, right? So like there's no more power to the intermediary, all the power or all the benefits accrue to the uh, to the dri- to the drivers and the riders. Well, I mean, again, I don't really believe it's that extreme, but certainly, if, for example, if the identity and the ratings and the information about the drivers and the riders is on a blockchain then that takes away a lot of the power, a lot of the strength of the network effects that you could accumulate around the proprietary platform. Now you still need some proprietary element, but wouldn't that take some of those away and therefore make switching costs? Like if, I, if I'm the driver, I can basically take my reputation, if, if my reputation, my identity is on a blockchain, I, can, I, can, I should be able to more easily switch between different competing platforms, shouldn't I? So, yeah, so I, so I guess the, uh, the, the, the question here is whether the, information is public and portable, right? Because right. uh, why wouldn't you be able to take your Uber ratings out? Why aren't well, you- Well, because it's controlled. So in the case of proprietary platforms, I think one of the things they do is like a lot of it. So a lot of it is completely controlled by them. Uh, yeah, but you can have you can have a screenshot of your ra- rating and this is your rating. And why can't you take this rating with to the other, uh, to, the, to, the, to another platform? And uh, so if we are going to, so I think that what you are assuming is that we are setting up a completely open decentralized platform on blockchain. So like I said, on blockchain, we can set up a platform that is centralized and limited. uh, So you can see the information, but you may not be necessarily be able to take it out. I mean, you can, to the same extent that you can uh, take a screenshot of your Uber rating and you can take it out. But uh, just because it's on blockchain does not mean that it's interconnected. By the way, so I think screenshot, so I think screenshot is a bit like, I don't think it would be credible enough, right? I mean, I think screenshot would not be enough. So you need to take a little bit more than that. But I think I, I see what you mean. So it would be, you. so I guess you can play around with how much, so you, like we, we can play around with how much control you can give over the information and how portable the information can be, so right? For, the, example, for the participants. So for example, are you going to, you can set, you absolutely can set up a, a, a platform on a blockchain where all the information about the drivers and the ratings will be publicly uh, publicly available. So then it would be easy to verify that indeed this platform, this platform, this driver has five stars. You can do that. Uh, would the platform want to do it? Uh, because why wouldn't Uber make it, make it public? Instead, what you are seeing, when do you see the ratings? of the, the ratings of the driver, you see it only when you, when you call and when you are matched with the driver. And the blockchain app can also show you this rating only when you have, call, when you have called, the, uh, when you have called the, the, the cap. So just because it's blockchain does not mean that everything is transparent. Uh, the blockchain app, uh, the D app, can make decision about what is transparent and what is not. Right. So, right. so, 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 for, for example, uh, you know, the very first D app, uh, which is CryptoKitties, uh, the uh, you know, composed of four, uh, four smart contracts, and we say so. If it's some, if, if the, if we have a smart contract on Ethereum, we can actually see the code of the smart contract, and we can see even the ledger of the smart contract. So, what, whatever is held in the, the state of the smart contract, uh, but uh, with CryptoKitties the genome of the crypto kitties is actually held, the algorithm that is assigning this genome is held outside. So just like I said, we have smart contracts and then we have a layer of other software and then we have the interface for the app. So where does this, where, where do the ratings reside? Do the ratings reside in the smart contract and therefore they are visible or do they reside in the layer of the, uh, of the software? So you can have like um, Uniswap has everything only in the smart contract. So everything is smart contracts, everything is visible on the, uh, on the blockchain. So now the question is, if you are setting up a, a D-app, you are making a decision about making it completely transparent 
and committing to this transparency or retaining some sort of uh, 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 some sort of uh, of power. And so uh, by the way, let me rephrase. I just want to bring it back. So I think this is a, I want to bring it back to the broader question because I think that's kind of what I'm asking, right? So like if you think about this continuum between pure Nakamoto uh, platform, which would be like I guess as like as close to everything's on the blockchain, like you're right, maybe not necessarily transparent, but everything's on the blockchain versus on the other side, pure traditional platform where everything's completely controlled by the platform. You can be somewhere on this continuum. So I think then the question is like, what are the trade-offs of moving between one end of the continuum to the other? So I just want to sort of bring it back one level. So switching cost is one. So it's, it's interesting to think about my intuition, but maybe it's, my intuition was like, if I move from proprietary towards Nakamoto, switching costs should get should should go lower the likelihood of tipping the market might go lower but you're right it may, it may not be entirely obvious but let me also ask about i just want to make sure like we also cover like the other there's a bunch of other aspects which i think are important i want to let you give you some time to articulate so what are the other tra like if i move from proprietary towards nakamoto along this continuum what are the other i mean there's some benefits and there's some there's some downsides so can we try to sort of like have at least at a high level phrase those well, so first of all, you don't need to set up a company to set up a DApp, right? You can set up a smart contract and you don't need to get anyone's approval uh, on like on Ethereum. You don't need to go through the process of uh, setting up a, comp a, a company and, uh, and, and hiring, uh, hiring people officially and paying insurance and, uh, and, uh, and, and everything else that is related to uh, costs of running business. Uh, you can have it at the, uh, the more sh uh, sh shoestring, so to say. Uh, so it is far more flexible. Uh, it is uh, it is kind of similar to you know two guys in a garage setting up Apple, right? But uh, uh, but but in the in the new in the new world, so it is easier. Uh, and uh, and yes, you can make it more attractive uh, by uh, setting it up in an open way. And at least promising that it will stay set up open way. The downside is that a lot of very few people can actually scrutinize the smart contract that you are bringing on, and uh, unless we have like companies that are doing the auditing, then there may uh, may not be may not be enough trust. But it's probably cheaper to set up uh, uh, up on the on the blockchain. Now you also need to worry about all the errors. If it's completely autom automated, then the errors are difficult to correct. Uh, there, nobody can override. If you by mistake you sent uh, your fee, uh, your transaction fee to be three three hundred uh, uh, bitcoins, uh, there's little chance you are going to get it back. Right. Right? And so the more decentralized it is, the more. Uh, cost upfront you need to uh, you need to put to make sure that it's working the way you want it to work, and uh, uh, Ethereum is full of smart contracts that are that are so malfunctioning that nobody wants to call them. Yeah. Uh, so is it is it correct to think of this as some sort of like I mean you need to get the mechanism if you're going to go towards Nakamoto platform you get you better get the mechanism designed right from the get go because once you let it go there's little like that's the whole point right I mean I can't really change it afterwards, it's a lot harder to change afterwards. So it can be changed afterwards, but then the question is who can change it? If you can, if you are doing it in a completely democratic way, that it's then, then, then basically decisions are not made. I mean, like even in democratic countries, we have the executive branch that is uh, that, that is making sure that things are working and the oversight and everything. So we have, if you have, a, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin it itself cannot fix a lot of problems. And whenever they try to fix it, they need to fork uh, because of the, the difficulties in making uh, decisions and making changes in a purely democratic system. So it, then if you give some people more power to make decisions, the more people, the more power the elites have, so to say, the more uh, problematic it, come, it becomes in terms of, uh, of extracting value. Um, so there's also, uh, I'd like to sneak in one more question if we could, and there's an interesting question in the chat from Andy Holt. Um, Andy, would you be willing to unmute and ask the question yourself? Uh, yes, not a good background. Um, my question is, information design, 
like so this sub branch uh, branch of micro theory. So you commit to certain statistical experiments that you give to some a strategic interaction in the mobility app. Um, we could think, for example, of giving information where there is high demand in the next place. Their um, optimal information design would be to not give it to all agents in the system. And I'm wondering, is it possible to, for a Nakamoto platform to commit to information this form, which is only some of the agents get information to some parts of the information, and they can they can trust the system given to us. Well, so the so 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 in a way, uh, we do have systems like this that give you uh, give you information on as need basis. So you can have the you can have a, a an, an even open blockchain and open Nakamoto platform that gives you information only as need basis, but it's going to be the same information for everyone. So if somebody says so, so this is kind of a, a zero. So what is important is that we have the same information that is verifiable. So you can't. Uh, so for example, what ways very often do, or you know, other GP, other maps, uh, you know, directions apps, is that you want to go from point A to point B, and they are not going to give you the same uh, the same route as everybody else because then it's going to just create congestion. They're giving different people different routes, right? Uh, so uh, so. Um, I don't know whether you can, you, well, you can do it if you have uh, additional layers of software. But if you have it, if you have information directly on the blockchain, that I don't think that it can be done, that, that shared information is different. Because if you are making a query, it should be the same information. So you can have it in, in a D app that is somewhere between the Nakamoto and Toulouse. Okay. So has been where this has been formalized I, I find this if this impossibility is stable I, I would find that very, very interesting do you have any no so I, don't, I I so so actually did, so I I haven't um, uh, and this is an interesting question there may be results in uh, so the, the, the definition of, of just pure stable, uh, pure smart contracts that are directly on Ethereum, for example. So, uh, so this is what a lot of uh, a lot of blockchains, smart contracts on blockchain say, that you cannot have non-deterministic calls. So all the calls need to be deterministic, which means that if you call a, a function, it needs to give you the same uh, with the same conditions, going to give you the same return. So this would be this would be probably equivalent to this impossibility statement if we if we turn it around. Um, so we re reached uh, the end of our hour together. What I would suggest is that I'll stop the recording now. And um, as I said, there's the opportunity for people to stay on the call if they'd like to continue the discussion um, on a more informal basis. And otherwise, I hope everybody would join me in thanking Hannah for an interesting and very informative talk. Thank you.